it's going to be a little bit similar, I would think. And uh, that is something that I asked our guest, Will Miles. So let's get into that conversation. Really appreciate it. Will, give me some time here on a Monday to discuss his latest article over at readandreaction.com. Highly recommend it. There's going to be a link to that article in the show notes as well as Will's Twitter handle, which is Will Miles SEC. So let's kick it over to that interview with Will. All right, Will, we're pleased to once again be joined by Will Miles. You can follow him at Will Miles SEC and head on over to readandreaction.com. That's where you'll find his latest article, The Narrative No Longer in Dan Mullen's Control After an Embarrassing Loss to South Carolina. And he's also got a show, Stand Up and Holler. I cannot recommend Read and Reaction and Stand Up and Holler enough. Will, thanks for joining me. I really appreciate you. No, nah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. It's always always fun to talk about Florida, even if uh, even if it's <laughs> tough times right now. Yeah. So, like I said, Ben, you did, uh, and I've seen the the reaction online. You've got to be thrilled with, uh, you know, everybody and everybody that's reading your latest article on Dan Mullen and just kind of the state of the Gator program. You did a heck of a job there. But I really wanted to ask you, you know, why his comments after the game about the band why did that really stick out to you of, of all the things you could have focused on yeah i mean you know you could focus on four and five you can focus on the stuff coming out from the athletic the week prior where they were talking of where sec east coaches were calling the team soft especially on defense but I, I think the big thing is is that when you look at the mullen era at florida one of the things that's been marked by is that he has been lauded when the team has gone 10 and three or 11 and two or last year when they beat Georgia, but he has started to, he tries to control the narrative. He tries to make sure that the only, that the information that gets out is tightly controlled by him when things start to go bad. And so, you know, when he was asked a question about the band and that was something that he really emphasized when he came to Gainesville is that he was going to go out there singing the alma mater, whether they won or lost in the last two games, he hasn't. And then when they asked him about it in the post-game press conference, he said he didn't realize that the band was there. And then there was video from earlier in the day where, you know, in 2021, someone has video and clearly it was, you know, a flippant response to a question that probably should have had um, a more thoughtful response. And if the response had been, you know what, I'm as frustrated as anybody, when you get frustrated, you do things that aren't necessarily within your character. It won't happen mm -hmm. again. Um, but you're right. I did promise that when I came here and no big deal or, you know, and, and I'll take care of it. Then everybody says no big deal. Right. But the, you're right. I didn't realize the band was here. Here, I'll get it fixed is the kind of response that starts to erode trust with a fan base that already has some eroded trust because of the performance of the team this year, because of the speed with which the changes on staff, obviously they came today, but or late last night, but the speed with which the changes to the staff have been made, the loyalty there, the inability to make what seemed like obvious decisions, but hard decisions. And so instead of facing down that hard decision, you make an excuse. And that's sort of what it was on, on Saturday. That's the thing. That's why it jumped out to me in terms of his response for that particular question. Mm -hmm. And speaking more specifically on the action on the field, when's the last time you've seen Florida play so poorly? <laughs> so 2017 against Georgia and Missouri, you know, right before mm -hmm. and after Jim McElwain got fired 2014 against Missouri at the end of the Will Muschamp era. Um, and then probably sometime in 2010 in the last year of urban Myers era, you know, th these types of games where you come in and let's be honest, South Carolina is a, is a, uh, plucky team maybe it's in south carolina stadium the stadium is full florida had no business losing to south carolina just like a lot of teams have no business losing to south carolina this year south carolina is building florida is supposed to be a more mature program they certainly are supposed to be a more talented program and instead and you know you lose a close game some turnovers don't go your way hey it's one of those games like we're on madden where the computer just decides you are not going to win okay <laughs> maybe you can make some excuses but to get waxed by 23 points and it wasn't that close South Carolina mm -hmm. took their foot off the gas in the second half. Um, you know, so to get waxed like that, there's just no excuse. And the only thing that anyone can really talk about is, is that it looked like the team didn't want to be there. And that's not a reflection on the defensive coordinator. That's not a reflection on the offensive line coach. That's a reflection on the head coach when your team looks like it doesn't want to be there. And Mullen today said during his press conference that they played with great effort, but not toughness. And uh, I, I beg to differ. Mm. Well, let me ask you this, because obviously with Mullen, I think 
as I think most people do up until this point, excellent developer of the quarterback position, excellent play caller, one of the best, not only in the SEC, but all, all of college football. What in the hell is Florida's identity on offense? Because I can't figure it out. Well, that's one of the problems is that there doesn't seem to be an identity on offense. They haven't been able to run the ball pretty much since the Alabama game. They've really struggled to run the ball. You can see if you look at their points per game, it tracks with the quarterback run game pretty closely. And so, you know, lo and behold, in the Kentucky game, Kentucky figured out how to bottle up Emory Jones and Florida couldn't put up any points. If you look at the game against South Carolina this past weekend, Florida couldn't get, you know, I think there was that there was that drive in the second half where they were in their own territory, like their own 30 and on third and one they ran Emory Jones and couldn't get it and then on fourth and one they ran I think it was Damian Pierce and or maybe Malik Davis and couldn't get it either and so you know for a team that leads the nation in running rushing or at least did up until the South Carolina game to not be able to get a yard against South Carolina who's one of the worst run defenses in the country says that they've lost their identity and you even saw it at the beginning of the South Carolina game they came out with 10 straight passes and all of us who follow the team including many of the fans who were not necessarily beat writers were like what is going on here like we all know South Carolina can't stop the run why are they throwing the ball? And I think it's a reflection of sort of what they have been seeing over the past few weeks where, you know, if you're not going to go out and be the most physical team in the, in the, on the field, you're not going to be able to run the ball. And that, that physical and toughness that Mullen was talking about there, I actually do agree with them. It, it, they did not look like a tough team against South Carolina. They looked like they wanted to be a finesse team. And, you know, the problem is, is with Kyle Trask, you can be a finesse team, but with Emory Jones and Anthony Richardson at this point, you can't, you got to put your shoulder down. You got to run over some people and you got to announce that you're, you know, that, that you're coming for the other team and that you're going to wear them down. And the only time they've done that this year was against Alabama. It was impressive when they did it against Alabama, but it turns out when you only do it once in a 12 game schedule, nobody's all that impressed. Now you reference it there, Todd Grantham, of course, gone defensive coordinator, John Hevesy, who's been, uh, I believe with Mullen since 2001, he's gone. Uh, what are your thoughts on those moves? And, and does that potentially clear a path for Dan Mullen to return next season as Florida's head coach, do you think? Yeah, I mean, so I think it's a, it's a start. I mean, obviously, the, the fan base has been calling for Grantham's head for probably about three years now. Um, I think the people who follow the team have been calling for it since the end of the Oklahoma game. That Oklahoma game was representative of the 2020 season and representative of that he didn't seem to be getting his message through to his players, not just in the Oklahoma game, but they, you know, the defense essentially cost Florida a shot at a national title last year with their mm -hmm. performances against Alabama and, and specifically against LSU and Texas A&M. That Texas A&M game, they had no business losing, and somehow they lost it because the defense couldn't stop anybody. The LSU game, they had no business losing and somehow couldn't stop Max Johnson in his first start on the road in the swamp. So the Alabama game, hey, you can, you can deal with that, right? I mean, you lose to the team, I mean, quite honestly, Honestly, last year's Alabama team was a pretty transcendent team. I'm not sure anyone was going to beat them, but if the defense had been able to get any stops at all over the course of those three games, that season looks a whole lot different. And so people were calling for Grantham's ouster, and a bunch of us, including myself, thought that it was a done deal. At the end of the year, he'd be let, done, be let go. Now, the problem is, is that you start looking at that and then say, okay, well, Grantham hasn't necessarily made the adjustments that he needs to make. But is that indicative of, of his supervisor, right? I mean, his supervisor, the adjustment was to change the defensive coordinator. The fact that you didn't change that defensive coordinator and now the defense is still a problem and can't stop the run and can't stop counters and pretty simple actions is indicative that the decision-making process at the end of last year was flawed and that waiting until now, the decision-making process has been flawed. I think if he'd have let go of Grantham, and, and Hevesy's a little bit of a different story because he's 20 years in and mm -hmm. he's more of a recruiting liability than he is necessarily an on the field liability. Whereas Grantham pretty clearly has been an on the field liability at least the last couple of years. So what I think is, is that had Mullen let go of Grantham at the end of last year, he would have gained a lot of buy-in from the fans. If he'd let go of Grantham after the LSU game, I think he would have bought in, got a lot of buy-in from fans. But what this feels like is that Mullen got so embarrassed by South Carolina that his superiors and the people who support the program monetarily said a change needs to be made. And that's why the change was made rather than the change being made as part of a good decision-making process. And so that's, that's the thing that worries, I think me and, and other people as well, when they look at this is, was the change made because the change had to be made because 
the noise was so loud that a change needed to be made? Or was it part of a decision-making process that's going to make the team better in the long run? Because let's be honest, if you're going to bring another defensive coordinator in, you got to follow a good solid process to find a good defensive coordinator and bring him in. So I, I, yes, this is going to buy Mullen time unless he, unless he, um, uh, unless he antagonizes people who are who are higher than him in the uh, in the chain, and and his press conference today I think was one of his better ones over the past over the past couple of months, unless he he becomes obstinate or something like that, which I don't foresee happening. I think this is giving him a runway to next year. I think the 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 rope will be pretty short, which means that the selection of assistant coaches that he has is going to either be they're going to have to give some guys some guaranteed money or they're going to have a limited selection in terms of who they bring in at the coordinator in the offensive line position. But, um, you know, this is the University of Florida. I think at the end of the day, you're going to be able to bring in high-level coaches. The question is going to be, is the decision-making process for bringing those people in sound? And the reason you would doubt that is because you're not sure that the decision-making decision in terms of, uh, or the decision-making process for making a change was sound. Yeah, I'm glad you you said that because I was going to ask you, you know, he certainly seemed – uh, to believe that, uh, you know, he'd be able to get quality coordinators in there. It, but it kind of reminded me a little bit, you know, maybe you can't compare every situation, but last off season, obviously LSU had a lot of trouble getting a defensive coordinator in there. Uh, well, that let's assume Dan Mullen does return. Does uh, his ability to, to land a coordinator, do you think that will say a lot about his uh, future status there in Gainesville? Well, I mean, the defensive coordinator is going to have to turn around the defense the same way Mullen did in 2018 when he turned around the offense. Because at the end of the day, they're going to need better performance on that side of the ball. And I, to be honest, I think they have the players. So if you, if you look at the overall talent profile, Florida should lose to Alabama, Florida should lose to Georgia, shouldn't have lost anybody else in the schedule this year, especially the way LSU was was uh, injured and hurt and sort of limping into that game, even though it was in Baton Rouge. So you know, that's sort of the baseline. And, and I think they'll be able to get that done with better, um, better defensive play. As far as the defensive coordinator, I think it's going to take a special situation. You're going to have to identify the guy who's like the Joe Brady when he went to LSU to take over that offense. Because if Joe Brady had gone to LSU and the whole thing had flopped, Orgeron got blamed. Right. And so that doesn't harm Joe Brady's career. Now, if Joe Brady had been some guy who was a head coach someplace else, got fired and then got brought in as offensive coordinator at LSU and the offense doesn't doesn't move, then he sort of got that. Well, he didn't get the head coaching job. Done. He didn't get the job as a head coach. Now he didn't make a difference as a coordinator. Do I really want to bring in a retread as that next career move? So to me, that eliminates guys who are sort of. Um, you know, you'll hear people throw out guys who are head coaches right now who are on the hot seat, who might get let go, who might come in, who have relationships with Dan Mullen. I think it eliminates those sorts of guys. I think it brings into play guys who might want to get back into head coaching. So, you know, you've heard guys like Gene Chizik mentioned. That would make a lot of sense because if Chizik comes in and makes a difference at Florida in one year, then he's going to get to move on and be a head coach someplace else if that's what he wants to do. Now, he's got to want to do that. It's got to fit with his um, – you know, with his family desires and things like that. But even, but Chizik has enough of a background that if he comes in there and things don't turn around, then it can still be a blame Mullen, blame Grantham situation when, 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 um, and he would get additional opportunities. So that, that I think is going to be the calculus for people, come, for people who come in. It's, it's a high risk spot because you don't know whether Mullen's going to get more than next year, but it's also a high reward spot because if you do turn things around, I mean, the way Joe, Va- Joe Brady is viewed in college football circles just off of that one year at LSU got him the job in Carolina. And if he wants to come back as a head coach in college this year, I think he'll have a list of, of organizations that are lining up to bring him back. And so, you know, that one year sets him up for the kinds of success that you can really get and being able to move up the ladder really, really quickly. And I think there will be some people who see Florida's opportunity defensive coordinator in very much the same way. So it won't be Will Muschamp. <laughs> no, it won't no, be Will Muschamp. No, no. <laughs> I mean, it, to be honest, that, 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 you've heard that a lot. One, it doesn't make sense from the standpoint of just, you know, bringing in a former head coach at the school to be a defensive coordinator um, doesn't make sense. Two, I think he's probably done enough at Georgia that he's going to get some opportunities elsewhere, which would make some sense. And then three, he's probably, I would think at this point in his life, I don't know that he's going to be looking to get a major college head coaching job. Maybe he just wants to relax and sort of be a coordinator Mm -hmm. and let somebody else deal with all the stuff that Mullen's dealing with on a day-to-day basis right now, as opposed to um, having to be the front 
front and center guy for, for one of these things. I, I imagine that as these guys, when they go through the pressure cooker of being a head coach, that when they get to step back and be a coordinator, that some of them really miss the power and prestige and authority and money that comes with being a head coach. Right. I imagine there are also people who just go, wow, being a coordinator is awesome. Like, I don't have to do any of the press conferences. I, don't, I get to recruit. I get to go out. I get to scheme and I get to coach. And that's it. And, and you know, some of these guys are real gym rats and Muschamp sort of, I, to me, the things that he struggled with at Florida were the administrative parts of being the coach and sort of the on-field decision-making type of things. It was not mm-hmm. bringing in players and it was not coming up with defensive schemes. Um, you know, I, I think you can actually sort of relate that to Mullen in some capacity where the things he struggles with seem to be the administrative things from a recruiting standpoint, having the organization set out in a well in a well-oiled machine type of way to accomplish those sorts of things. But he loves just drawing up plays on a napkin and going out there and, and, and chucking the ball around. So um, no, no Will Muschamp. So how I got to give you credit also for something you've been harping on for years, and that's the recruiting at Florida and how it's just it's it is what it is until, you know, as long as Georgia and Alabama and, and LSU are recruiting at such an incredible level. How in your mind does does Dan Mullen in Florida turn that around uh, to, you know, it's not going to be overnight or anything, but just just turn the direction of the recruiting around there in Gainesville. Yeah, well, this is actually where I think the staff changes might make a difference. I mean, there were some players who tweeted out some stuff. I'm sure they've been deleted by now, but tweeted out some things where they were actually happy that Grantham and Hevesy had been removed, which is a, a pretty damning indictment of, of, mm-hmm. of, of those guys when it comes to, you know, the guys on your team, you want them to have your back. And if you don't have their back, then, you know, hey, that says why, why some things might have gone south. You know, Neil Blackman over at Saturday Down South, today had an article out where a Florida staffer was quoted as calling it the most toxic environment I've ever dealt with. And so, you know, hopefully these are the people, uh, again, assuming that's true because that's one Florida staffer and you don't know what that motivation is and those sorts of things, but assuming that that has been excised from the building, then all of a sudden you've got players and coaches all moving in the same direction because I think when you look at it what you saw against South Carolina was players and coaches moving in two different directions and you know Mullen even during his press conference said that he thought that Monday through Friday the team team played great and then they didn't show up on Saturday it's like well again that says that the coaching staff and the players aren't moving in the right direction so all of that to be said that the best recruiters are going to be your players and so if you've got a toxic environment, then when the when the new prospects come in, yeah, they'll say great things when the coaches are around. But then when they take them on their visits, they go, eh, this is the way this works here. And, and, you know, that's you want your guys on the team to be evangelists for the staff. And if they're not doing that, then that's where things get problematic. So to me, mm-hmm. young guys coming in in those positions who are enthusiastic, who get along with the guys, who make sure that the players become evangelists for the prospective players is the way you turn that around. And then the other way you turn it around is you lock down the high schools in Jacksonville. You lock down the high schools in Lake City. You get down there to Lakeland and lock down those high schools. You look at it. I'm not sure you can prevent Alabama from coming down and taking players out of Florida, but you sure mm-hmm. need to be able to prevent Georgia from doing that. You need to prevent Clemson from doing that. You need to prevent Ohio state from doing that. Like Alabama is a machine and there are people who are going to want to go to Alabama and play for the tide regardless. And I'm not sure that you're going to be able to stem that at this point, but you got to protect your home, your home turf. You got to draw a circle around Gainesville and say in this circle, we will not lose. And, you know, yeah, you're going to lose a few, but at the end of the day, you got to win more than you lose. And, you know, I think it was, it was either last year's class or two years classes ago. I can't remember which one, like every top 100 wide receiver in the state of Florida went to Alabama or something. Or it was like the top four mm-hmm. wide receivers in the state of Florida went to Alabama. You can live with one, you can live with maybe two, but if all your best players are going out of state, that, that's, that says something about your recruiting strategy and the relationships you're building, because it should be easy for them to stay home. And the fact right. that they're not, you know, again, hopefully the, the changes they've made today are going to reflect that. But I, I honestly don't know. All right. Last question for you, Will. I really appreciate all your time. Does Dan Mullen have to win out this regular season? Sanford, Missouri, Florida State. Does he got to win them all to keep his job? I, I don't think so. I, I think the the timing of getting rid of Grantham and Hevesy means that they're going to give Mullen another year. I think that's the writing on the wall. Again, if he does something that's like egregious, um, mm-hmm. you know, where it's like insubordination or or right. or or does something kind of like last week where he stuck his foot in his mouth talking about recruiting and, and the noise gets unbearable, maybe. But at the end of the day, if the administ- if the noise coming into the administrators was enough that Mullen was going to lose his job, 
without, um, you know, with further declines in performance the rest of the year, then I don't know why you make the change with Grantham and why you make the change with Hevesy today. You either decide that you're going to get Mullen out of there and you're going to have Hevesy and Grantham stick around, or you decide you're going to ride this out to the end of the year and then make an evaluation there. And I think the fan base, if Scott Strickland had come out and said, look, we're not going to make any changes in season, stop asking for it, but we will make hard decisions at the end of the year. I think the fan base would have said, okay, what he just said is... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that everything's that everything is on the table and that Mullins Mullins coaching for his job. The fact that at this point he's made changes with Grantham and he's made changes with Hevesy, I think is a tacit admission that they're going to give him next year, at least to, to prove this thing out. And quite honestly, the turnovers have been really bad this year. And if they can fix that, there's going to be an improvement next year. The question is going to be how big of an improvement is good enough for the fan base. And the problem for Mullen and the problem for Scott Strickland is that Mullen has lost a significant portion of the fan base where 10 and two and a loss to Georgia ain't going to cut it. And I don't know whether 10 and two and a loss to Georgia next year is going to cut it for, for Strickland. And there's a disconnect there in terms, I think a little bit in terms of what the fans expectations for success in 2022 is going to be versus what the administration's idea of success for 2022 is going to be. And I'm Mm -hmm. very interested to see how that works its way out because, you know, we saw it this year with Grantham. There was nothing he could do that was going to bring some of the fans who wanted him gone at the end of the year back short of shutting out Alabama, LSU, Georgia, and Kentucky, right? Like, like if Florida won those games because they gave up no points, maybe some people in the fan base would have forgiven Todd Grantham. But the first time he gave up 200 yards rushing, it was going to be he needs to go. And it is interesting that the defense up until the LSU game was actually playing pretty well. And still, you heard a lot of when's Grantham going to go, when's Grantham going to go. I think you're going to see the same thing next year, right? Is even if things start out well, even if Florida plays well, I think they face Utah to start the season. You know, even if they come out of the shoot 3 and 4 and there's going to be a segment of the population that's waiting and saying, hey, you haven't shown it to me yet against Georgia. You haven't shown it to me yet against Alabama. Until that point, I'm not signing off. I'm not coming back on the bandwagon. And that's unfortunate because, you know, you really want your fan base to be on the wagon and heck from, from my perspective, from a, uh, from a selfish perspective, it's a lot more fun to write about a program that's winning where everybody's in lockstep with the administration, with the coach than it is to write articles about what kind of changes need to be made. All right. He's Will Miles. He's at Will Miles SEC. Head on over to read and reaction.com to read his latest. Will, I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks for joining me. I, I really, really do appreciate it. Thanks so much, Michael. Appreciate it. I had some great stuff from Will. I really appreciate him joining the show. And once again, his Twitter handle, WillMilesSEC. Head on over to ReadAndReaction.com. Read his stuff. He does an outstanding job over there. Support what Will's got going on over there, covering the Florida Gators. He does an outstanding job there. And check out his show. The links to all that can be found in the show notes. Another A great point he made there, kind of noting that, uh, you know, I thought uh, of all the things that Will – said there the thing that really stood out to me is the fact is that talk on the defensive coordinator and Dan Mullen will have to find his Joe Brady so to speak and I'm not saying that uh, this guy would take the job not heard anything about it but there's one guy that I think fits that criteria and it would potentially hurt your key rival Looking up there at Athens, co-defensive coordinator, inside linebackers coach Glenn Schumann. That is a name that if I'm Dan Mullen, I pick up the phone and try to get to Gainesville. I think it would make a lot of sense. He's Now, he's been with Kirby Smart, Glenn Schumann has, since his days at Alabama. He's been there the entire time. He And just think of all the linebackers that Georgia has seemingly annually. They've got an all-SEC linebacker or two. They're landing four- and five-star linebackers every single offseason. That's a guy you implement the the Nick Saban, Kirby Smart-style defense. Now, it's not as simple as picking off one of their guys, and obviously overnight it's going to help you out, but it's certainly going to help you on the recruiting trail. Glenn Schumann noted as one of the uh, top recruiters in the SEC just something to think about. And it, it kind of fits the profile of what Will was talking about with uh, with Kirby, Dan Lanning, Will Muschamp, how much light is getting shown on, on Glenn Schumann and the job he's doing down there for the defense at Georgia. I don't know. I don't know if he gets enough credit. But I know him as one of the best 
assistance in the SEC, and it's go. It would be tough, I would imagine, to get him from Georgia, particularly to go up uh, to a division rival. Uh, I don't even know if he'd take the job, to be honest with you, because of uh, you know I don't think Kirby Smart would hold it against him by any means, but I don't think he'd want to lose one of his key assistants to Dan Mullen. But maybe that's a move you make because it would elevate you to if Glenn Schumann wants to be a head coach. He's going to need to be a full-time defensive coordinator, probably away from Kirby at some point. So, hey, that's just a name that uh, pops out. And again, I'm not saying that I'm hearing that already or anything like that, but uh, that is one that you potentially really help your defense and you hurt Georgia at the same time. So it'll be interesting to see who Dan Mullen tabs here, if he even keeps his job there in Gainesville. But that's one guy that uh, I would have circled on my radar.